Um, it's, it's my great, great pleasure to introduce Ralph uh, Weislader as being the, the next speaker in this session. I, I met him relatively recently personally, and we started working on a small collaborative project, but as I already mentioned, everything that I've heard from him has been focused on deep understanding and concern about experimental design and the biological question. So I was very, very impressed uh, of, of our relatively uh, <coughs> short interactions that, we, that we've had so far. And I thought that he would be a wonderful and inspiring speaker to come and tell us about all the wonderful things that quantifying uh, proteins in single cells can do for clinical diagnosis. So I look forward to hearing that. So good morning, and um, thank you so much for inviting me. Um, you have heard about how to do this. Um, this is a different kind of talk. This talk is more, why do we want to do this? Um, so first of all, I have to confess that I'm not a proteomics person, I'm not a mass spec person, but rather I'm a clinician um, who lives in the systems biology community. So Nikolai and the other organizers thought that it might be good for you to hear um, what some of the clinical needs are and um, where some of your analytical techniques could have really an impact on how do we treat the patients. In other words, um, how do we bridge the gap from clinical practice to mass spec and use this information to improve diagnosis and treatment of our patients. And so I thought what I want to do is um, illustrate some of these um, concepts, thoughts, um, with the example of cancer. Um, as you know, um, cancer is a disease that is very often biopsied, so we get cells that we can analyze. It is common. Uh, there's about 600,000 new cases of cancer in the U.S. every year. So virtually everyone has a friend or family friend who has been affected. And importantly, it's a, it's a huge problem. It costs our economy $10 billion a year, $10 billion just for cancer treatments. So it's usually expensive, and much of this is... Um, wasted money, quite frankly, because we don't know what we're treating. And so it's trial and error. So it's a good problem um, to um, throw technologies at. So um, what are some of the clinical questions that we deal with? So first of all, how can we improve and simplify, above all, medical diagnostics? How can we determine if a patient benefits from a given treatment, and these treatments are coming out of the woodworks, so many of them. How does human biology really work at the systems level? Uh, Mr. Jones comes through the door. How do I know how his cancer cells work or how his immune system works compared to someone else who just walked through the door? And how can we detect cancer much earlier when it's still curable? So as you can see from these questions, and, um, and I'm showing you these questions because uh, that's sort of what I deal with on a, on a daily basis. As you can see from the questions, we're still in the dark ages in the hospital. And the current knowledge that we base decision-making on is often from textbooks, from cell lines, uh, from empirical clinical data, but not from analytical data from cells from our patients. Uh, so very important concept. Now, um, in the era of precision oncology or molecular oncology, uh, deeper analyses have become really critical. And as you know, uh, cancer is evolving 
So longitudinal information is very important in patients. So just not just initial um, analysis when a tumor was resected, but really longitudinal information to inform treatments. So there's two ways of getting at cells. Um, one is, is there a, one is, by sticking needles into people or taking um, uh, tumors out and then analyzing those cells. And the other big area is, uh, is through liquid biopsies. And here we don't stick needles directly into tumors, but we sample the blood and isolate either circulating cancer cells, circulating free DNA, or small vesicles that are pinched off from cancer cells. These are called exosomes or uh, tumor extracellular vesicles. So uh, the sources of cells then are either through needle-based approaches or through uh, blood approaches. So today I will focus on some of these tests and with a particular emphasis on where proteomic analyses would be particularly helpful. And so I will focus on three different vignettes. Number one is enabling pathway analysis in single cells in real time. And by real time, I mean in the clinic, same day. So not really real time, but same day through fine needle aspirates. The second vignette I'll tell you a little bit about is our joint project here uh, with Nikolai on identifying new drug targets on a new immune cell type that we um, identified last year. And the last story um, that I'll finish up with is, um, the, is it's the challenge for all of you. If you think that single cell proteomics is hard, try single exosome analysis. So that's the challenge for you to go home with. So let's start um, with processing of uh, samples in the clinic. Now I'll tell you a little bit about what we have done um, and what we're currently doing in the clinic and how proteomic analysis could really inform on what we ought to be doing. So cell harvesting in the in the clinic is performed by, uh, as I mentioned briefly, uh, sticking needle into people by ultrasound or CT guidance into areas of interest. These needles are usually 15 gauge needles, so anywhere between 1.5 and 2 millimeters in diameter. Um, and through these needles, we use guns, cutting core guns, these monsters that take little tissue fragments. And these fragments are about a millimeter in diameter and about two centimeters long. And by virtue of taking these tissue cores out, sometimes we hit blood vessels and patients have complications. They don't occur that frequently, but in, major, in most major clinical series, the complication rate is somewhere around uh, 2%. Now, in large clinical practices, as in the major hospitals around here, um, people die every year from these procedures. So death is not unheard of. So we have to think very, very carefully of who gets biopsied, why do patients get biopsied. The turnaround time in pathology departments is, for, for processing of these samples anywhere, uh, from two to 10 days, depending on what we do, and longer if we need to do genomic analysis. Now, the alternative to this is a fine needle aspirate, so nomenclature. So for these fine needle aspirates, we take much smaller needles, um, 20, 22 gauge needles, um, that where the result are actually cells that are being harvested, so not tissue fragments such as here, and because we're using much skinnier needles, the complication rate is about 10 times lower. So this is the type of procedure that we can do pretty much in anyone out there without major complications. And I must say, in the 30 years um, that I've been doing this, um, I have not seen a single death with a fine needle aspirate, but I've seen quite a few um, with this approach. So my lab has been very interested in using these materials, these single cells that we harvest from patients, to 
understand the makeup of these cells. So in, in, in conventional clinic uh, or in pathology departments, uh, they're primarily used to figure out, is that cancer or is that not cancer? And that's about it. That's the, the sort of the current level of sophistication. But we were interested in really doing pathway analysis in these cells. And so a couple of years ago, we had developed a technology, a DNA, uh, an antibody barcoding technology, to start to analyze dozens and dozens to hundreds of proteins in these cells. And so it works as follows. So we take, we aspirate tumors, and at, early on we had to do a negative selection through microfluidics where we got rid of host cells because we were not interested in analyzing the host cells that was before the immunology craze, and we were primarily interested in identifying tumor cells. We then take these purified, enriched tumor cells, incubate them with antibodies that have a DNA barcode. After these incubation steps, cleave off the DNA barcode, sequence the barcode. The, this uh, DNA barcode, by the way, is from the potato genome, so as not to confuse it with human genetic material. And this gets read out either by sequencing um, or by methods such as the nanostring methods. And so uh, several years ago, for the first time, it was able to allow us to look at about 100 proteins in cells I obtained from lung cancer patients. And we said, well, this is all great. This technology was subsequently licensed to nanostring, um, and so we have nothing to do with them. Um, and I approached them, and I wanted to do a larger clinical trial. And so they come back with a cost estimate that was prohibitively expensive, uh, around about $2,000 per patient to analyze this. And so that put a damper on that technology for us. So we went back to the drawing board and said, how can we modify this technology so it's much higher throughput, even cheaper and doable in a lab setting? And so here's what we came up with. So we're still using currently monoclonal antibodies that have a DNA barcode. But this DNA barcode has a primary barcoding strand, no, it has a, um, a, a complementary fluorochrome strand with two fluorochromes at both ends to render this entire complex fluorescent in one channel. Okay. By the addition of a simple melting buffer, we can dissociate these twos and get rid of the fluorescence. We then use a complementary strand here, uh, a capping strand, to close this and come back in with the next antibody. So in a clinical scenario, this would look as follows. One takes needle aspirates, incubates these cells with different colored monoclonal antibodies, so anywhere between four to eight different colors. Dissociate this after one takes images with a microscope, dissociates this and come in with a second set of six to eight colors and multiple cycles. So it's a cyclic immunofluorescence method, if you wish, at the single cell level, and this can be analyzed and then displayed as data. Now, the reason why we like this approach very much, as opposed to putting fluorochromes directly onto the antibody, it's hard to get rid of the fluorochrome. Um, one could theoretically quench the fluorochrome or chemically cleave it, but it does not work well with single cells on glass. It might work with uh, paraffin embedded sections and tissue sections, but for single cells, this is a much gentler um, approach. So let me show you um, some examples here. Um, it's a little bit light, so you might not be able to see this, but these are um, cells that were stained with EGFR and phosphorus 6 phosphorus 6 of course, is inside the cell during the first cycle. One adds this melting buffer, no signal at all. 
someone comes in with a second set of antibodies, and so these are exactly the same cells. So this cell down here is this cell, this cell is somewhere down here. Hard to see, these cells are the same cells up here. And you can see that here, the phospho-AKT or the AKT levels um, show virtually no overlap. Again, melting buffer and, someone, and one can come in with the next set of probes. So this technology, this cyclic uh, immunofluorescence and using melting buffer in between uh, to wash away the fluorochrome strand works um, exceedingly well. So we have used this method to actually do pathway analysis in freshly harvested samples uh, from patients. This is a common pathway um, that we and others are very interested in. Uh, so RTK pathways or the PI3 kinase and RAFMAC uh, pathways. Um, several pharmaceutical companies have developed drugs that inhibit these key proteins here. And the question is always in the clinic, does a patient with a certain cancer have these targets expressed, number one, and number two is if they get my expensive drug that's going to cost a hundred to two hundred thousand dollars a year, does that really shut down that pathway? Yes or no? So those are the questions. And so for the first time, I won't go through all of this, but for the first time doing this um, uh, harvesting, one can actually do sort of dose response curves and see when pathways get shut down. So we have tested this now um, in around 100 patients or so, and I'll just show you a couple of examples um, early on. So, um, so here we're looking at, I can't really see from here, but something like 10 patients, 12 patients. This graph just shows you what is the number of cells that I can obtain by simply sticking a needle into patients. And so it's somewhere, the mean is somewhere around 200,000 cells. It's actually quite remarkable. So this is a skinny needle, a 25 gauge needle just stuck in under ultrasound guidance and I get 200,000 cells out. Now of those 200,000 cells, um, they're host cells, immune cells, and they're primary cancer cells, right? And so it wasn't quite clear to us of what was what. And there's tremendous heterogeneity. So for example, if you look at patient 13 here, somewhere here, 80% of all those harvested cells were actually host cells, not even cancer cells. But in other patients, such as number 21, virtually all the sampled cells were actually cancer cells. So tremendous heterogeneity. So all of this is important to figure out. Um, and without going into too much detail here, um, we'd like to analyze the data in terms of certain ratios of proteins of interest, like phospho-AKT over P10 or RB over um, E2F ratios, where we display for any given patient what these different cells do. So this is not the important part. The important part here is, as I told you before, Nothing is static in cancer, and things change over time in our patients. So the real power of this technology is actually the ability to do the sampling longitudinally, before treatment and after treatment, because as you can see, there is tremendous variability of these proteins, just these two proteins you know, in the sample cells in our patients. So here, uh, I'm plotting for a number of different patients. So let's just focus on patient number four up here. This is before I start treatment with a novel PI3 kinase inhibitor. And this is the same tumor sampled after. So looking at about 100 cells or something like that before and a week after treatment, so continuous treatment. And so you can clearly see, number one is the spread of this pathway has uh, been reduced, and also the mean has been reduced. So the lower 
um, these ratios, this is the phospho S6 over S6 ratio, the lower the ratio, the higher the inhibition. So it should go down. Another way of looking at it is, is longitudinally here um, for, for different ratios. So this is phospho S6 over S6. This is phospho AKT over AKT. This is another EBP1 uh, over 4 EBP1 ratio. And so with inhibition, with drug inhibition, these ratios should be going down. But you can clearly see this patient 16 is not doing so well. Um, and so this treatment, this very expensive treatment, is probably totally useless for this patient. Um, we're just wasting money and not doing anything. Uh, whereas for the other patients, it works actually quite well. So pharmaceutical industries are interested um, very interested in this type of analysis because for the first time it allows them to not only um, to figure out whether there's still residual cancer, but also what happened to certain pathways that they're targeting. So why am I telling you all of this stuff? Um, I'm telling it because right now we only look at targets that we are sort of interested in because someone has published on them or because that's our current understanding. But there are opportunities for the field um, such as yourselves. Um, so the opportunities are questions like which protein biomarkers, identifying which protein biomarkers are actually best suited for therapeutic decision making. And so we don't have good answers to this. Today it could be phosphorus 6 but maybe there are other proteins out there that are actually much more sensitive, much better, and we just don't know. So in order to get to this, I think we need to do um, proteomics on some of these primary samples. Another one is, are there equivalents of serum biomarkers so we don't even have to biopsy someone? What if we could get the same information just um, from serum? And then ultimately, can we develop predictive biomarkers uh, to initiate um, therapies in patients who will actually respond uh, to this. So, um, so those are some of the challenges um, for those of you who don't know what to do and are looking for um, things to do. Um, so um, let me move on um, to the next topic that I briefly want to sort of cover. Um, there's a lot to digest here. So. Um, we are very interested in using single cell technologies to better understand um, human biology and the human immune system, uh, particularly with the renewed interest in uh, and success of cancer immunotherapies and understanding some of their failures. Um, there is clearly um, a knowledge deficit out there um, when it comes to um, the immune system, and particularly the innate immune system. And that is where we have been focusing. So like others in the field, we have used, um, embraced uh, single cell RNA-seq. Um, it has become a really truly enabling technology. And we use it uh, basically to um, come up with maps, um, TISNI maps or um, um, equivalent maps to put different immune cell populations on the map and then figure out what are subpopulations. So for example, uh, this population up here um, called MO, or standing for macrophage, it's actually not one cell population. So we now know that there's at least 10 different subpopulations in this macrophage pool alone. Uh, that have completely different effects in the cancer context. Some are immunosuppressive, other, um, other uh, are pro-tumorogenic. Uh, um, and importantly, um, we're using this to identify which proteins um, can be used to identify these subpopulations of cells, what are the functional differences and how these cells are defined molecularly. So without going into too much detail here, 
I want to tell you a little bit about one story um, that we published last year. It's a, it's a fascinating story. Um, so it turns out primary human lung cancers, crafty as they are, send out secrete signals, long-range signals, to tell the bone marrow of all things to start making a unique cell, a neutrophil in the bone marrow that gets then released from the bone marrow, homes back into the cancer, and exerts cancer-promoting function. So the tumor cells secrete a signal, we know what it is, as rage soluble receptor for advanced glycation of end products, that tells these cells to start producing, to populate the cancer, to fuel its own growth. Really devious. But that's what happens in patients with cancer. Now, of course, since we discovered um, this pathway, we have been interested in two things. Well, we want to get rid of these cells because we don't want the cancers to grow. So the question here is, what are, and by the way, these cells were identified through single cell transcriptomics. Um, so the question is, what are good drug targets in these cells? These cells have a name. They're called cyclic F-high neutrophils, um, at least in the mouse. And the second question is, what is the heterogeneity of these cells? Um, do they, are they all cyclic F high? Are they, you know, what are the drug targets in them, and how heterogeneous are these drug targets? And so this was, um, all of this happened at a time where um, I met Nikolai, and we said, we teamed up, and I said, but hey, wouldn't it be great uh, to start using mass spec? in trying to answer these questions. What are good, because I had zero clue on what the protein makeup was of these cells. Wouldn't it be a great idea to answer these two questions? And so what we did, and it's an ongoing story, so I don't really have any hard data yet. Um, what we did is we went back to the mouse. We um, intravenously injected these tumor cells. They home to the lung. These mice get lung cancers. Uh, four to six weeks later, we harvested these tumors, digested out and purified these cyclic F-high uh, tens or tumor-associated neutrophils and sorted them, sorted single cells um, into water and then um, brought them over here for mass spec. And so um, at this point, we have, to the best of my knowledge, only done some bulk runs, but even in the bulk run, um, we have been able to identify um, a number of proteins in these cyclic F-high cells um, that are putative drug targets. So a lot of, and is this correct or is this not correct? I don't know the answer. Um, it's irrelevant as far as I'm concerned because all of these would have to be validated anyways in a therapeutic setting down the line. And if mass spec was wrong, tough luck. Um, um, so that's currently um, where we are. From my perspective, really, really exciting time um, because it allows us to pinpoint uh, to potential proteins of interest that we would otherwise have no way of, of knowing uh, what to target. So, um, so let me move to the challenge set here, uh, the plasma exosome analysis. Um, again, this, I believe, is a field that could benefit from proteomic analysis, advanced proteomic analysis, but the stakes are even higher than for single cell because these vesicles, these exosomes, are so small. Um, so what are exosomes? Um, this is an entire cancer cell here. And as we zoom in, you start seeing these tiny little vesicles. They're, they are about 100 to 200 nanometers of size that are actively um, 
secreted by cancer cells. These vesicles make their way into the bloodstream and they can be identified in the bloodstream of our patients. In terms of biogenesis, um, um, they form um, through invagination of the plasma membrane and these vesicles fuse with each other. They, uh, they form these multivesicular bodies and the multivesicular bodies then uh, get excreted and these tiny little vesicles are shed into um, the circulation. So again, there is two types. I, I started by saying that tumor cells make them, which is all true, but it also turns out that our host cells make these vesicles as well. Some host cells make these vesicles as well. So from a diagnostic perspective, it will be very important to figure out what is a TEV or tumor um, exosome versus a host exosome down the line. By the way, the, they have also not only diagnostic importance, but also functional importance. So it turns out, again, a fascinating story from melanoma. Um, so it turns out as melanoma cells release these vesicles, our host or uh, lymph nodes and particularly macrophages in the lymph nodes recognize these materials as something that they shouldn't be there, so they engulf them. But sooner or later, tumors secrete so many of these vesicles that this primary immune defense mechanism in lymph nodes gets overrun. They shed into the circulation. It turns out they bind to B cells and for, through some mechanism which we don't understand, promote the formation of IgG, which leads to tumor growth. So it's another devious method by which tumors create these feedback loops um, to fuel their own growth. And for those of you who are interested in, this was published in Science um, last year or the year before. So, these vesicles then are important not only diagnostically because we can, use, we can isolate them in the periphery, but they're also important to understand um, um, cancers and how they work. And they have also become important therapeutically and there's now several companies out there that are using these vesicles to actually put materials in them, proteins of interest um, for therapeutic purposes. So um, I started this whole uh, talk by saying um, exosomes. So it turns out that exosomes are just one type of vesicle. Um, there are other vesicles. There are microvesicles that are a little bit larger, have different molecules. There are exosome-like vesicles. There are apoptotic bodies. There are oncosomes. So there's a whole bunch of these vesicles that are being shed by our cells. And because the nomenclature is difficult, because the different vesicles, it might be better, particularly for the clinic, to call all of these vesicles, these tiny little things, EVs or um, extracellular uh, vesicles. So what are the current problems or opportunities? So this EV pool, the extracellular vesicle pool, contains heterogeneous vesicles exosomes, microvesicles, I just mentioned. There's protein overlap between the host cells and the tumor cells, which, in, which in, within each tumor vesicle type, there is probably considerable heterogeneity in protein expression, just by assuming that there is heterogeneity in protein expression in, in the parental cells. And there are some existing uh, proteomic studies and databases, but they're fairly limited. And I'm not saying this as a criticism to the field. On the contrary, it's just that the data sets are very sparse and limited. And most of these things were done in cell lines and went with conditions and approaches that has very little to do with clinical reality. Uh, and so currently, there's only 338 proteins in the database, and we know that there are much more. So, um, 
So what are some of these proteins um, that are made and, and transported um, in these little vesicles? Well, here is a list of some of them that have been published in some of these publications here. And you can see, just, from, just looking at the year here, um, a lot of this is old uh, material. But this is sort of the state of the art currently of this field. So from a clinical perspective, again, and using these vesicles for diagnostic purposes, there are two important questions. So let's assume we take blood from someone from one of our patients, and there's two types of vesicles in them. There's blue vesicles of different shades, and then there are the tumor vesicles. So two questions. Number one is, what's the protein composition of normal host cell EV? So we can identify the blue ones. The second one, what are the proteins or combinations of proteins that define the tumor-derived ones? So if we had the answer to both of these or either of these, we would be leap years ahead in our diagnostic capabilities in serving uh, our patients. Now, with respect to the first question here, we have a reasonable, reasonable answer. So it turns out that these five markers here CD45 on vesicles, not on cells. Um, CD44, 44B, CD31, and 235A um, define about 80% to 90% of host vesicles. Unfortunately, not 100%. And herein lies the conundrum. So if someone comes in, if, if I took your blood and the younger population in here and we're, and you are or we were cancer-free, and I analyze these, and I say, well, 80% of them look pretty clean. I can call them host cells. But there's 10 to 20% they could be cancer cells. We would all go nuts here, right? So we need to do proteomics to understand what the other 10 to 20% are so we can use this information to clearly classify someone as benign. So that's the challenge here. The second challenge um, is equally important, and that is what kind of proteins do I need to identify to call a vesicle a red vesicle or a tumor vesicle? And this field is a mess. Um, and you can't read this either. <laughs> so it's a double mess. Um, it's a complicated table, too. <laughs> but it's currently the world knowledge of what markers are useful for what cancer types. And so let me walk you through here. So the columns here, the first column is glioblastoma. The second one is colorectal cancer. The third one is pancreatic ductal adenocarcinoma. This is ovarian cancer. This is breast cancer. And this is lung cancer. Green means that a protein listed in each row here has diagnostic information that has been validated in clinical trial and is actually useful information. Gray means it's not applicable. Usually the protein has no relevance. And so, for example, um, no one would, I can't even see this, um, no one would measure, for example, HER2 in a glioblastoma. That's why this is great. But in a breast cancer, of course, we would want to know if there is HER2. Question marks, we don't know. Um, and this list down here are rejects um, of proteins where publications have come out and said, well, wouldn't it be great to measure thrombospondin to, um, to diagnose pancreatic cancer? And so we have tested those, and uh, not good. Um, so, so a lot of trial and error here, right? Uh, we don't know what we're measuring and what we ought to be measuring. And um, the one thing that's very clear, though, is that not a single protein is going to be useful, but it's more likely that some sort of signature of protein or n multiple proteins um, are going to be more useful. And this is 
what this combo means or the signature here. And so the one example I want to show you um, of how this very painstaking detective work on which proteins work and which proteins don't work has led to a new diagnostic test. Um, and so this is with respect to pancreatic cancer detection using this signature here, PDAC-EV, which measures five different proteins, EGFR, EPCAM, MUC1, GPC1, and WINT2. So we had rolled this out um, into pancreatic cancer um, uh, populations. And so the experiment here was, so patients with known pancreatic cancer or conditions that could simulate pancreatic cancer came in, had their blood drawn, we looked for these vesicles, and we looked for proteins on these vesicles. And as you can see, in this cohort, these all had, all of these patients had surgically proven pancreatic cancer. And there's not a single protein that's positive in all of these uh, vesicles. I mean, it's all over the map. But when one adds up the signature, uh, most of this is red here, and that's bad. And if we compare this, for example, to pancreatitis, that's just an inflammation of the pancreas. It's all blue, so that's good. Or these are age-matched people who came in for some other abdominal surgery uh, that didn't have pancreatic cancer. It's also all blue. So it turns out that this test, which we evaluated in 150 patients, has a sensitivity and specificity um, around 91% and 85%, which is really, really, really good for clinical diagnostics. And so the reason I'm showing you this is um, to re reiterate it one more time is that this detective work has yielded important clinical information, but if we knew what we're looking for, this could be even better. I mean, this could be 95% or even higher, right? And ideally, the specificity higher. So in order to understand what's happening here, um, we have recently developed methods to start analyzing single EVs. And so the way we're doing this um, is by imaging so far. And it turns out, so we're looking at single vesicle. This is a dividing cancer cell, and you can see these vesicles being shed off, tons of these vesicles. By the way, um, the concentration of these vesicles in the blood is somewhere around 10 to the 9th to 10 to the 11th per milliliter. So they're, they're just, blood is just chock full of, of these vesicles. Um, and it's not like circulating cancer cells where one has to find one out of a billion other cells. No, these are very abundant and they're very stable and hence they're very attractive uh, from a diagnostic perspective. So it turns out that the trick of imaging these guys with conventional microscopes, so not super resolution microscopes, but conventional microscopes in the clinic is to immobilize them on the glass surface. And so once they're immobilized and caught, we can come in with the same antibody um, fluorochrome conjugates as I showed you in the beginning of the talk and stain them for different markers. And so we have done this, and I'll just show you one um, example as a teaser of a publication that's currently in press, where we analyzed microvesicles from a neurosphere. So this is a glioblastoma cancer cell neurosphere um, where the common knowledge is, number one, is all of these are positive for integrin beta-1. And number two, a number of tetraspanins should be negative. And so when we profile them, as you can see here by the color coding, about half the vesicles don't even have the marker that's supposed to be diagnostic for this vesicle. So this is something that we didn't even know about. And number two is... Other markers, these tetraspanins, uh, PSG 101, CD81, CD63, Alex, and so on, they're not even supposed to be on these vesicles, but they're clearly there. Um, this is information that is currently, uh, of course, not 
obtainable um, by bulk um, analysis. And um, so it would be great if one were able to extend, um, so obviously with this t technology, we, we go in looking for specific proteins because those are the ones we're interested in. But if we had a proteomics approach here, um, we could uh, figure out what the composition of the entire EV proteome is in health and disease. Um, and then um, with the overall goal to develop next generation diagnostics um, based on this information. So um, something to digest, to think about. I know this is extremely uh, challenging. Um, but it's always good to think about the future after you have solved all the single cell proteomic problems. <laughs> um, so I'll stop here. Um, so I've shown you three different examples on how we do diagnostics in the clinic through FNA analysis of human cells, um, identifying new immune cells through transcriptomics and doing plasma exosome analytics um, for diagnostics. The current systems, they work okay, uh, but they could be much better if we had a better understanding of the proteome and what to look for. And so probably the best thing is to think about this as the lamppost analogy. So right now, we're looking right under the lamppost where there is light, right? The opportunity is in the dark, and that's what we need proteomics for. So thank you very much. Ralph, thank you so much for a stimulating talk. And I'll start with a couple of questions. Sure. And then I'm sure the rest of the audience will have some too. But with the exosomes, now that they're so small, is there a reason to focus on protein and not messenger RNA? RNAs would be easier to quantify if they contain them. Have yeah. people tried that? Oh, yes. Yeah. Uh, so, so actually, um, most of the companies focus on RNA. Um, exosome Diagnostics does, and there's a number of other companies that, that do that as well. And there are problems with that. Um, number one, the, the, the number of mRNA molecules in these vesicles is much smaller. Between zero and one. one <laughs> between zero and one, <laughs> and not 17. Right. Yeah, so that's number one. The proteins, again, are much more abundant. Um, the proteins are the ones that matter uh, because the proteins are the one that determine the pharmacokinetics of these materials um, and how they behave in the human body, um, and hence, hence the interest. And how, how all the proteins that you can determine with the antibodies, they have to be on the surface. How were you? No, like so they're semi-permeabilization methods ah, okay, uh, where okay. one can semi-permeabilize okay. um, both the cells but also these vesicles, yeah. Thank you. Other questions? Sam. When you get to the extra vesicles, you can call it zero cell proteomics. Um, <laughs> I have two questions. One was uh, for the, the fine needle aspirates, yep. the percentage of cells that are host, is that random or is that how much coffee one had that morning? Or Yeah. Um, well, as you know, cancers are very heterogeneous, right? I mean, they bleed, they necrose, and the immune system comes in, tries to repair tissues, and so it may be sample-related, so if we biopsy the periphery a little bit more rather than the center, it could be due to that, or it could just be due to some cancers are, are much more inflammatory than others. Um, so there's no, like, standard operating procedure that one could... Okay, and my second question was with the, <clears throat> the Siglic NK cells. Um, what did your RNA... Not NK cells. These are... Neutrophils. Neutrophils, sorry. Yeah. Um, what did your RNA seq result, your single cell RNA seq results, how did that overlap with the single cell proteomics that you were looking at? Yeah, so we don't know the results of the single proteomic studies. The, the population was just identified by RNA seq. Okay. As a subpopulation of the overall tumor associated neutrophils. The volcano plot is proteomics, yes, yes. 
I, I have a question about the uh, when you measure in, uh, um, peptides that have been phosphorylated versus uh, unphosphorylated part. Have you done just repeats several times of the same so, so yeah. patient in, in very nearest time and see what your CVs on that ratio would be? Yeah, because so it's, yeah, the question it's, related to the worry, you know, you know, phosphorylation is pretty labile kind of modification. That's number one. Number two, when you stick somebody with the needle, you know, you have a response that everything just hijacked. Phosphorylation will be the first response of the patient after the couple of words that he tells you. That's why I'm worried, you know, how's the CV upon the, the same patient in a very close time space would look like? Yeah, so all I can tell you is, you know, what would what does this look like in repeat samples? And so we did this. So, for example, one poor patient, um, we actually biopsied repeatedly, um, and it was fairly clean. Um, so the results, are, um, once we plotted them, they were very, very narrow within each other. Um, so we haven't done this in a lot of patients, but... Um, in the one or two patients that we did before, it was it was pretty close. So I can imagine that there's certain uh, phosphorylations that might be very labile, depending yeah. on how much wine you had last night. But when you look at phosphorylations that report on the activity of pathways, uh, which drive cell growth in the tumor, those might be quite stable and reliable indicators of uh, yeah. whether the therapy is working. And this also, we, we look at multiple ratios. So, for example, not just phosphor six, S six, but also, you know, all the other ones that I showed to you. Yeah, Steve. What's your rough sense of how many RNA and protein molecules might be present in individual vesicles like this, and and also, can they be fact sorted? Yeah, so, so um, mRNAs, I would say one, zero, one, or two, <laughs> maybe, right, because these things are so tiny. Um, I mean, theoretically, I, you could probably fit six, seven in there, but it is generally thought, uh, these vesicles are thought of, they're sort of mini-me's of the parent cells, and if you have 17 mRNAs in the parent cell, how many are you going to have in one little vesicle? <laughs> it's few, right? Um, oh, but total across all the elements, so across all proteins, how many protein molecules, or across all mRNAs, how many mRNA molecules might be present in the in Yeah, um, that's a good question. I don't know the answer. Yeah, yeah, I don't know the answer. So my experience with exosomes is, uh, I mean, there are, there are a lot of different cells that are shedding them. Uh, and so you have, when you isolate them or enrich them, you have to have a marker that you're looking for. Otherwise, you, you wind up with a real mixture of exosomes. And they, um, even then, they're not very clean. So single cell exosome analysis may actually help solve that problem. Uh, but they're certainly hot now. Um, second question, that's a more, I guess, more of a comment than a question. <laughs> uh, second question is, um, just kind of thinking about this issue of, of tumor cell diagnostics, looking for drug targets, et cetera, et cetera. Um, is it better to look at the static proteome, do you think, or to look at uh, the more dynamic proteome? Because you could, there, there, are, there are some technologies now, some methods where you could take a biopsy out, throw them in, um, for example, uh, azotohomoalanine solution, for a couple of hours, and then you could measure what proteins are being actively synthesized as part of the as part of the tumor cells, and you could look at that population pretty selectively. Yeah, um, I don't know. Um, what's your, what's your, my my gut feeling is, yeah. for something to work in the clinic, it's ought to be simple. I mean, it. I mean, you'd be amazed at the. Um, it's, it's, it strikes me great research project. Uh, we'll understand new biology, but is it doable in the clinic? Um, I would scratch my head on how even to do this. And so in the clinic, I mean, so difficult things already. How do I get the sample from the operating room to pathology or to the lab? I mean, to transport, patient transport. I mean, do those, it's got to be simple for the clinic to work. And, and it's got to be cost effective too. So that's the whole other thing. So there's tremendous price pressure on how much can diagnostic tests actually cost. And if there were absolutely no other way of getting at that information, I think it's totally um, 
viable. Um, I think it's a great research project. I think it makes a lot of sense. It's very interesting. I'm just not sure, you know, practically speaking, um, of how useful um, and competitive it would be against other tests that are out there. If you can establish that that information is absolutely critical to our Yeah. Absolutely. Yes, yes, yes. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. I enjoyed your talk, all three parts of it. Um, I have a question about the first and the third part, so two questions. Okay. The first question is, um, I understand the need to make the decision quickly, the same day decision. You cannot wait to see whether the drug used uh, worked or not. But what is the correlation between the pathway being activated or deactivated and the cell dying? Is it... Um, this should be a very strong link, right? Otherwise, yeah. So, um, so the key question in the clinic is: am, with this drug that I'm giving, right, and where each treatment costs, each day of treatment costs several thousand dollars, you know, am I even hitting the drug target, and is it doing something to the average of cells that I'm looking at? So that's the question. Um, Okay, yeah, thank you. So the second question is uh, the, um, the third part, the vesicles. Mm -hmm. So I understand that the, the ultimate aim is early diagnostics, mm -hmm. uh, but there are results showing that early diagnostics leads to explosion of the uh, number of reported cases, but not necessarily in the decreases in, mort in mortality, because in many cases, the emergent cancer is being suppressed by the immune system or other. Um, yeah, I'm not sure that the jury is out on that, quite frankly. Um, so, you know, you may be right on a population analysis, but just imagine yourself. If you had that test and it were positive, <laughs> did you want to rely on your immune system <laughs> or taking it out? <laughs> That's why I don't want to take this test. <laughs> uh, about the third part, and thanks for, yep. for your talk. So single, uh, single exosome analysis sounds like a, a really challenging uh, topic and uh, we are enjoying developing te new technologies, we can jump on that. But is it a wrong message there? Do you really need to uh, look at this? Each cell may uh, produce probably thousands and millions of exosomes and microvesicles. Yeah. There are like billions of cells and so on. And you, you get the point. Yeah, no, I, I, I actually agree with you. I'm, you know, I, I'm not suggesting that you should develop single EV analytical proteomic methods, um, only if you're really bored. Um, <laughs> but what we really need in the field, I think, is a better understanding of the proteome of homogeneous vesicle populations so we know what to look for you know, diagnostically. I mean, that's what we need. And so, I mean, we could, we could even um, isolate, separate, and pool some, some vesicle um, subpopulations and analyze those. And I think even that would, would be tremendous, tremendous, tremendous value. I love seeing how many questions there are, but I will allow one more. Um, this is actually a combination question for you and for Nikolai, um, based on your talk as well. Um, I wondered if, so with your antibody approach, you have the advantage of getting to look just at S6 and phospho S6 without having to wade through all of the actin and tubulin and everything else that's going on in the cell, which is pretty awesome for uh, antibodies. But in mass spec-based proteomics, we don't get to do that. Um, so I wondered if you might comment on what the abundance of the proteins are that are actually useful markers. And then if Nikolai, you might comment on what the depth is that we can actually get. And are we accessing the, at a single cell level, the proteins that you actually see are clinically relevant? So I would say, just shooting from the hip here, that most of the relevant proteins, the pathway proteins, are on the lower end relative abundance. Um, so um, it's not like motor proteins or cytoskeletal um, protein, you know, or tubulin, really abundant things. So lower, lower abundance, I would say. I'll but very we quick. can clearly see some uh, 
many or most of them in, in, the, in the proteomic analyses? I'll, I'll be very short in my response. So that depends on how much you want to focus on particular proteins. There are two ways in which you can do proteomics. One is you target peptides and proteins by in order of their abundance and rely on speed that you quantify enough so that they're both abundant and lowly abundant. There is also the approach where you can focus on particular peptides that are less abundant and you can spend much more time, you can afford to have a slower instrument, which can give you at least an order of magnitude gain in abundance, perhaps more. So at, at the moment, based on what I see in my lab, I, I feel confident that even with the first approach, we can quantify proteins present at the median confidence of uh, 50,000 copies. But by targeted methods, we should be able to go to at least 1,000 molecules, I would think, uh, per cell, which will take care of almost all proteins, which will come at the expense of, of lower throughput, but it can be done in lower throughput still means many hundreds of proteins and peptides quantified. All right, so that's wonderful. I very much enjoy the discussion, and we'll have plenty of time for that uh, uh, during the lunch session and coffee sessions and so on.